So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another q and I'm just pouring myself some nice mint tea from my favorite tea company, a place called T2. And yeah, as always, we're gonna get into an awesome Q&A. If you want your question answered, very, very simple. Just make sure you hit subscribe and most importantly, turn on post notifications because somewhere randomly within the week, I'll be putting out one of those, hey, I'm doing a Q&A, ask me some questions. And I usually pick questions within the first two hours or so. So with no further ado, let's get straight into it. When you had that anxiety period last year, what did you do to figure out exactly where it was coming from? So that is a question pertaining to um, uh, you know a video that I released uh, called uh, Seven Life Lessons I Learned in 2020. Uh, and that was basically all about, um, well, I, it, it was exactly what it said in the title, which was Seven Life Lessons. And it kind of followed the year almost chronologically. And uh, somewhere around July, August, I ended up getting, um, you know, just crippling anxiety, uh, panic attacks, uh, suicidal thoughts. Like it was a pretty intense period of my life, especially considering I never faced anything like that before. Now, what did I do to find out exactly where it was coming from? Now, if you're facing anxiety, uh, depression, uh, anything like that, meditation is by far the best medium and the best tool that you have, um, you know, in order to do that self discovery to figure out where it's coming from, because, you know, stuff like this can come from chronic inflammation. You know, there's people that if they change their diet, literally tomorrow, their entire depression would go away. Right. Um, so it could be things like chronic inflammation, it could be things like past trauma, uh, or it could just generally be raised cortisol and raised stress for an extended period of time. Now, for me, I know that it wasn't the cortisol or the stress aspect of it, um, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, I had just come off the back of probably seven of the best months of my life. You know, 2020 was actually an incredible year for me, especially the first half of it. I got so much done. I was in a really, like I was, I was just really at peace. You know, I was in Cape Town, obviously, you know, the world was all kind of shut down and I was in Cape Town with, you know, one of my best friends locked in, in the house. Um, yes, I couldn't see my friends or family for, you know, I was actually gone from London for almost six months. Um, but as I said, it was just a really peaceful period of my life um, and a really happy period of my life. So it definitely wasn't stress because I've been through periods of stress way, way, way worse than that. Um, so I knew it wasn't that it looked like it was chronic inflammation, uh, you know, part chronic inflammation. Now it kind of came around the, uh, the time that I ended up getting something called psoriasis and I ended up getting it, you know, the spectrums of it. It's, it's something like 2% of the population has it. Um, but you know, for most people, like for example, uh, you, you know, I now looking back, I realized that at certain points I had had little like psoriasis things, but you know, never really like you know, you would basically just think it was like a little spot or something. Um, you know, so most people have like a bit of psoriasis here and there, but I ended up getting it like all over my body, like probably around like 70% coverage, really bad. Now what psoriasis is, it's chronic autoimmune condition where your body basically thinks it's under attack. Your, your body thinks it's your skin is under attack. So it ends up producing more skin cells um, than is needed. Um, but the thing is with any of these autoimmune conditions, it is, you know, most of the time is due to, uh, you know, inflammation, right? So uh, here's the thing to certain, and, and, and that's basically what it looked like. And that's kind of what took me down the rabbit hole of doing a carnivore diet. And that ended up clearing my psoriasis um, and just basically removing any sort of inflammation in my life. Like, you know, quit caffeine, uh, obviously quit alcohol during that period. Um, and yeah, in general, just kind of forced me to tighten the ship up. So that was one aspect of it, 100%. Um, but quite frankly, you know, because I still had psoriasis going into like mid, you know, towards the end of August, but it just wasn't, you know, um, towards the end of or, or beginning of September, you know, you know, basically most of September, I still had it. I was, I was you know, uh, clearing it, but I still had it. I guess obviously, you know, I had less and less uh, of that inflammation in my body. Um, so I don't think it was that. I think maybe that was just like the cherry on top. It, I can't give you a, a, a real specific reason. And I think, um, you know, sometimes it is rare, but sometimes just, you know, uh, they call it like the dark night of the soul. Sometimes just things come up and it's, it's so, there could be so many different factors that it's hard to trace back. You know, I've had periods of my life where I, um, you know, I'm definitely under stress or I'm in a bad mood and I can isolate, hey, this is why this is happening, right? And meditation is kind of my medium in order to do that. I can go, okay, Iman, it's very clear that this is the reason that you know, you're feeling under the weather or this is the reason that um, you know, you've just been feeling very stressed or very moody or you know, a whole host of things. Um, that was not really a situation where I was like, okay, I can pinpoint it to this. 
right? So um, yeah, I can't really give you a reason, but if you're trying to dissect it, first of all, look, you know, the easiest place to look at is, is your diet, um, is any sort of inf you know, inflammatory things you're doing. For example, things like coffee, it's horrible for you. You know, I view things like alcohol, you know, literally uh, today, for example, um, I usually work six days a week uh, and I take Saturdays off. I'm actually working today, and, uh, you know, it's a Saturday. And, you know, in, in a couple hours, I'm gonna have, uh, you know, quite a few drinks. Um, you know, I'm seeing some friends, this, that. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing quite a few friends. I have a little get together, I'm gonna have tons of drinks. Uh, and then for the next two months, I'm gonna start, uh, I'm going back into monk mode, which is, you know, strict carnivore, um, carnivore plus avocados, that's basically my diet. Uh, you know, no caffeine, no alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not like I'm a robot, but, um, you know, there's easy places to look at in your life where just just cut it out and that you know a lot of the inflammation uh, will go away even things like um switching from coffee to things like matcha um that's one one easy easy win so um that's i guess that's the easiest place to start is just look at your diet whatever you're consuming and look at things that might be potentially causing uh, inflammation um the second thing is uh from there just meditating will do so much for your anxiety and depression now i Obviously, it was weird for me. It was like it was a six week in like so intense, such so intense six weeks. Right. Uh, and I was just thrown into the deep end where like I was literally like, my, you know, the people around me were literally watching uh, a, a mental breakdown unfold. And thank God it didn't go in the other direction. But I, I got so intensely plunged into that place. And then, you know, almost within the space of like 14 days just went away. So, you know, really all I can say is during that period, I was meditating, you know, like for me, I had those tools with like, as I would wake up and my heart would be, you know, just beating and beating and I'd be having these panic attacks. Uh, the first thing that I would do is I'd go and I'd sit and I'd meditate, right? So the thing is I had these modalities and, you know, in general, like, you know, um, you know, I was exercising, you know, I was doing all the things you should do, sleeping well, exercising, meditating, and still I had all this stuff coming up. So, um, you know, just understand if you're not meditating, like that is such an easy, easy place to begin. Uh, and just to help settle some of your anxiety, stress, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing actually. And then after that, looking at any sort of inflammation in your body, um, because we all have inflammation in our body, lots of it, right? Whether that be from EMFs, uh, whether that be from, for most people, you know, 90% of the equation is the foods you're eating or things like too much alcohol. I mean, if you're smoking cigarettes, um, if you're, you know, if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're having alcohol, if you're doing, ca if you're having caffeine, and by the way, all these things I do in, you know, I do in, uh, you know, I, I'll do every once in a while, you know, um, you know, I, I did two or seven weeks of no alcohol, then I had alcohol for a week, and then now I'm, I'm going back into another two months of alcohol, you know, a coffee, maybe I'll have once a month, um, you know, a cigarette, maybe I'll have once every three months. And like, it's, it's funny, I posted something on Instagram, um, you know, of me like, uh, you know, smoking a cigarette, and people are like, appalled, and I'm just like, Look, what, like, you know, if, if you have a, you know, like, it's, it's no uh, um, secret that I have, uh, like cigars, as an example. So I don't, you know, I'll have a cigar maybe once every two months as well. Um, so these little things, these trace amounts, um, you know, they're really, they're really not that bad. You know, they really don't do much for you. As I said, really the main things is just chronic, chronic inflammation. So um, anyways, long story short, that was kind of where I was at in terms of my, um, in terms of my search for where that uh, depressive episode um, and you know that the, all those panic attacks during those weeks uh, where that kind of came about was I had no real explanation for it. I was meditating. I was doing all the stuff that I should have been doing. Um, you know, my diet was good. You know, I've always eaten healthy or relatively healthy. So there was no real reason for it. And sometimes as I said, you know, I I kind of have one foot in two worlds, one foot of the very practical world and the other foot in like the spiritual world. And there is something, you know, you can look it up, dark night of the soul. And I believe that was my dark night of the soul. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, uh, that answers your question. Now, the next question is as a watch uh, guy like yourself, I think Richard Mill looks objectively cool. However, I heard that it's very unlikely they'll keep their value since the company has only been around 20 years and their designs are gaudy. Uh, what's your response to people who say they're just cool looking trash that will be worth nothing in the near future? Um, I think that's definitely a valid point. Now, I would never take the risk unless I viewed it as like lost money. I would never take the risk of buying a Richard Mill um, at market value. You know, um, the uh, only Richard Mill that I've uh, bought um, has been at, um, you know, d directly from RM. And obviously here's the thing, if you buy anything from RM, it, you're basically making money if you go to sell it. Now, 
obviously, you know, for me, anything that I get at retail, I also want to keep. So I guess, you know, this is a relevant question to me because, you know, I've got something sitting in my watch collection that's worth, you know, circa $200,000, actually a little bit more than that right now. And I'm very, it looks very close, you know, um, um, I'm definitely in the next six months about to buy my next RM. It's just a matter of which one it is, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm working on it, so I don't want to reveal anything too soon. Uh, you know, it looks like I might be picking up a very, 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 very special piece. Um, I mean, a piece that you you actually, you know, like you find most of the stuff on Chrono 24. You can't find this on Chrono 24. Like it's that special. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I'm looking to pick that up. I guess the thing is with, uh, with Richard Mill that you need to understand is it's, if you're buying an RM, you're at that point in your life where you just don't care. You know what I mean? You're at that point in life where you're so wealthy. Like the, here's the thing. You look at someone, you know, who drives up in, for example, a Lamborghini, you, just, you need to understand that, you know, first of all, if they have any sense um, and hopefully, you know, I guess a lot of people don't have much sense, but if they're buying a Lamborghini, for example, I will never buy a new car in my life ever, unless, you know, this is 15 years down the line and I'm, you know, uh, buying a special McLaren or a special Ferrari or this, you know, if we're talking your Aventadors, if we're, we're talking your uh, 488s, if we're talking your uh, McLaren 720s, I would never in a million years buy that new, right? I'm gonna buy that with 2000 to 3000 miles on it. Let some other idiot take the depreciation on it. Um, so my point is, you know, let's say someone's got, um, you know, pulling up in a, in a Ventador, you know, I don't know too much about car prices, but you know, I think used with like 4,000 miles on it, that car is probably worth, you know, quarter million dollars, a uh, quarter million pounds. Or let's say $300,000. Um, your well, actually conversion rate uh, is, is way worse now. So let's say like, you know, $330,000. You understand that that person could finance that car, you know, over the space of four years, you know, probably pay like 5,000 bucks a month. When someone is walking into Richard Mill and buying a $200,000 watch, they're not buying that car on finance. They're buying that car, or sorry, they're buying that watch in cash, right? Not physical cash, but you know, they're putting that on the Amex, right? When I walked in there, that's that's going on the Amex, right? That's not, I'm not paying it off. I'm not taking financing for it, et cetera, et cetera. So when I see someone pull up, you know, when I see someone with a with an RM on their wrist, to me, I'm like, you're, you're at that, like, I see them as the same level of wealth, um, as someone who pulls up in, let's say, like a, a, a La Ferrari, right? Um, or maybe, or, or maybe a P1, right? Um, because the thing is, I said to be able to put two hundred thousand uh, dollars, just you know, some of them go up to half a million. Half, some of them go up to like four million dollars. But you know, let, let's say most ones, if you have an RM on your wrist, it's it's, it's at least two hundred thousand dollars, pretty much ninety nine percent of the time, right? If you're putting at least uh, you know anywhere from kind of usual ranges, two hundred thousand to four hundred thousand dollars on your wrist right and you're paying cash for that you're you're a, you're a whale you're a big dog right now rm only makes 5000 watches a year and in 2020 they made even less than that and probably the same thing in 2021 because of everything that's going on in the world um so it's very very exclusive pieces now you know i think you know i think when there is a, a market crash and you know uh, there's a, a financial crash which is inevitable right <laughs> like everything that go comes up must come down right um I think the entire watch market is gonna take a hit, but I don't, I think RM is gonna take a hit in accordance to, like, I think, you know, if you look at, say something like, you know, uh, the RM compared to my 5711R, you know, that's a, a rose gold Nautilus in the UK right now, the cheapest you can find is 110,000 pounds, $150,000, right? That's a, four, you know, I, I've been very, uh, I was very privileged to buy a retail from Patek uh, themselves. So I paid 45,000 pounds for that watch. Um, I, that's, I, that was actually my second time owning it. I actually owned it for a month. Um, back in September, I bought it at market value knowing that it was underpriced and sold it at market value a month later. But, um, yeah, you know, now that I got a retail, obviously that watch I'm just, just will be in my collection for the rest of my life. I'm, I love that. That's my grail watch personally. Um, but anyways, that's a watch that's like 45,000 pounds that sells for 110,000 pounds. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's nuts. Um, so everything in the market, right? Real estate watch, like everything is crazy at the moment. Um, now I do think re, uh, watches are in general, a great store of wealth. Um, if you look at, let's say something like, uh, you know, let's say, or let's say something like a, um, yeah, for example, a 5711R, you know, a hundred thousand pounds and, you know, a, uh, an RM, um, 1103, I think is around like 220,000 pounds, you know, 120,000 pound difference. I think when there's a crash, it, both of them will crash, you know, by 25% in value, but it'll be a sliding scale down. Right. I don't think all other watches are going to hold value and RM is just going to crash. Honestly, you need to understand that the clientele that buys those watches 
they ha they have infinite money. You need to understand that, you know, when I'm trying to uh, pick up a, or, or, you know, I'm, when I'm speaking with, um, you know, the manager at RM, right? And, you know, uh, I, I chat with him probably at this stage, you know, uh, once every 10 days, he gives me a call. I give him a call. You know, we chat about general stuff. They take care of their clients very well. You need to understand that, it, you know, in his position, he's got, for example, the watch that, uh, you know, I'm looking to get. I said, I won't reveal it. But first of all, there's none in the world right now, right? Like you, you can't find it, right? And probably, you know, probably in the first 10 months, I would assume, uh, or probably in the first, you know, six months, I would assume that maybe they make five, 10. So you need to understand RM's clientele. RM's clientele are politicians, are, um, you know, are, are politicians or, or more retired politicians <laughs> with all their crony money, but, um, you know, are uh, CEOs, presidents, are rappers, are uh, footballers, are like literally the, the elite in the world right? They are the elite. Um, and you need to stand that like, if it was their choice, you know, with these rappers and, and you know, you even see it with some of the, the some of this royalty, they come in, they've, they've literally got infinite money, like actually. So if they could come into RM and buy, you know, a hundred pieces, they actually would, right? And that's the level of money that some of these people have. So you need to understand, you know, there's uh, rappers where if they could get three RMs of retail a year, they would, because the thing is probably, you know, they get a, you know, a couple pieces here and there at retail, and then the rest they actually have to pay market value for, right? Um, so they're paying, you know, an extra 50%, 100% premium on it. So I think RM has done things really, really well, even in the, fa in, in the fact that here in the UK, they opened up a, uh, like a, a secondhand RM store. So now as an RM, like, let's say, for example, I wanted to sell my RM30, right? I don't have to go to a, a dealer to sell that. I can basically just go to RM directly. Uh, I can go to RM directly and they can sell it. So really they've cornered all aspects of the market. So, um, yeah, as I said, you know, I will in 20 years, um, that tonneau shape from RM, will that be hot? Um, no, but you need to understand that most people who own RMs own multiple other watches. And it's just, I said, RM is just such an exclusive club. If you're buying directly for RM, right? It's such an exclusive club. So I think here's the thing. Do I think that the market, uh, the resale value will plummet a hundred percent? Would I ever buy an RM at retail price from like a watch dealer? never in a million years. So I am feel safe knowing that RM's price, like you know, I feel safe knowing that my, you know, when I buy an RM, it will never dip below the price that I've paid it for it, right? And put it that way. And for the, you know, the people who buy an RM, uh, you know, 1103 at a 70% um, uh, premium to what the retail is, you know, that's your choice. If you feel comfortable doing that, do it. I would never in a million years, I would never feel comfortable. I'd be shitting myself. Um, so yeah, that's why I just buy directly from RM, build a relationship. Um, and you know, it's just, yeah, they're awesome to deal with. Uh, I love RM as a company. Um, some of their watches, uh, can be hit or miss, you know, I, some of their watches can be hit or miss. I will say that. And, you know, I, I will say, I always have a love hate relationship with it. Cause sometimes I like fall out of love. I'm like, dude, this thing is ridiculous, right. To wear. Uh, and then sometimes I'm like, yeah, Yo, you know, there's just nothing better. Well, you know, when you're just wearing a nice t-shirt, you're tanned, you got your chinos, you know, you got some nice uh, corduroys on, you got your new gadgy, um, uh, uh, gadgy principal tee, uh, you know, some nice uh, pair of sneakers, some golden goose, or maybe some long bonds. And uh, yeah, you're just looking, you're looking fly. You're looking fly. You're looking toned down, classy, but with, you know, with a workhorse on your wrist. So um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know it's not everyone's cup of taste, a cup of taste, cup of tea. <laughs> All right. Next question is curious as to how you're doing attribution now because of the iOS 14 uh, working out rows must be a pain in the ass and attributing purchases to a specific ad must also be a pain. Do you use external software like Hyros? Well, actually, you know, when the whole iOS 14 thing came out, um, there was a three week period where I wasn't signing any, like all the new clients I was signing were just base because we wanted to feel out what the effects were going to be. Now there was one specific client where the rise uh, dropped a ton and that actually picked up after a few weeks. So literally across the board with all of our clients, we have seen literally no difference. Right. And I'm even surprised by that. You know, I was thinking that, you know, we might take a hit. I mean, I even mentioned in one of my videos that, you know, I might have to rethink my pricing. Right. Um, and we might have to do it based on, you know, uh, potentially uh, 
you know store uh, on the you know because there's certain businesses where literally they know 90 percent of their sales come from ads so you know with them it's it's fair enough that you're taking store-wide uh, percentage of rev minus ad spend um so you know we were starting to explore these other sort of deals but quite frankly we haven't to uh, we haven't needed to and i will keep you guys updated if that changes um but so far all of our clients especially february you know um we've we've uh, built some fat performance fees we have seen no difference now there's certain clients um that uh and, and you know th these clients we have performance fees and they do high ticket phone call funnels uh, you know our info power clients uh, with those we use hyros but in terms of all of our e-commerce clients we have seen no issue whatsoever um and as i said i say that with a bit of surprise myself because i was you know i was getting ready uh, you know I was, <laughs> some people were like oh it's the end it's all over but you know yeah, guys I, I remember when uh, people thought that with gdpr back in 2018 and literally nothing changed and so far we have found that basically nothing's changed. We'll keep you updated if anything, um, you know, if anything differs in, in a few months. Next question is, if you're just starting out with SMA, which is more important to have a website or to have a contract? Or ideally, should you have both? A contract you definitely need to have in place when you actually sign a client. A website you don't need. You know, go ahead and watch my video. Tristan will leave it right there. Um, how to start an SMA with zero dollars. You know, to start an SMA, all you really need is a business domain, which you can get for like 10 bucks a year right with Google domains. And then from there, a business, uh, a business um, email, right? And that's six bucks a month. So you're out of pocket, basically $16 in your, in your first month. You don't need to create a website. Now you can, if you want to, uh, you know, you can create a, create a cheap one with Wix, just super simple. Um, you can, if you want to, but it's not a necessity. What is a necessity is a business domain and a business email. That is a necessity when you're doing outreach. So you know, that's basically that. Uh, as I said, in terms of contract, of course, you're going to need a contract when you actually go to sign uh, with the client. You send them over a contract, an e-contract, and, you know, it just works that way. Next question. Is there ever going to be a Kaizen Cure 2.0? P.S. You're such a role model, bro uh, brother. Appreciate the kind words. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Kaizen Cure was actually a product that I launched all around mindset, uh, all around uh, dis discipline, mindset, um, uh, meditation, I, I mean, so many broad topics in that. Um, but basically everything outside of the business that makes you a better business owner. And really, I think what has separated me over the years uh, from everyone else. Now, I stopped selling that product in around like towards the end of 2019. You know, that product I sold for 500 bucks because basically I just decided to put that product inside of Agency Incubator and make it even better. You know, I think uh, Kaizen Cure is around five hours. I think the um, uh, week two, uh, the mindset training, uh, and well, you know, week two is mindset, but it's also mindset and basically everything around the topics of, um, uh, you know, uh, peak performance, biohacking, like, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, I basically just decided to make Kaizen Cure three times better and just put it inside of Agency Incubator because for me, it was a non-negotiable. Everyone needs to learn this sort of stuff. So um, for me to create a Kaizen Cure 2.0, I don't see the point in charging someone for that because I want that to be in my flagship program because the, the information in there is so, so important to know. So will there be a Kaizen Cure 2.0? Unfortunately not. I will just, because I just put it all inside of Agency Incubator and made it even better. So um, yeah, unfortunately there won't be. So ladies and gents, I hope you guys all enjoyed. Down below, go ahead and check out the Gadgi giveaway winner. Every single time I do a Q&A, we give away a piece of apparel from Gadgi on the main channel. The main channel giveaways, we actually do blue light blockers. And on the second channel, we give away a piece of apparel. So you can find the winner down below and you can find the instructions to enter. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Now, real quick, before you click off and get on with the rest of your day, I want you to do one quick task for today. Right below, you'll find a link to Agency Incubator. I don't want you to buy it. I don't want you to enroll. Just simply go on the page watch the 15 minute demo, see what it's all about. And if it interests you at all, just book in a call with Christian, my student success manager. He'll walk you through it. He'll walk you through, you know, kind of questions like I, I went through, you know, because uh, he actually used to be an agency incubator student, um, ran his agency for a few years. He even actually launched his own uh, info product um, and, you know, launched his own course in the Spanish market and then just decided, you know, why am I doing this when like uh, I could represent and I could work with, you know, the leader in the industry. Uh, so he actually has been working with us for three, four months um, and, you know, been loving it. So anyways, reason I say all this is, you know, he's been in your shoes before, right? You know, he's had the questions that you had of like, hey, do I need a website? Do I need a contract? And he'd be more than happy to answer those questions for you and also see if you're a good fit for agency incubator. So go ahead and do that now. We look forward to speaking with you. I'll see you in the next video.
Hey, look, if you enjoyed that video, I went ahead and picked out another special video that I know you're going to find immensely valuable. You can find it right there. I know you're going to love it and I'll see you in the next one.